In this first video, we're going to look at the background. In order to discuss World War I in America at that time, we need to go back and cover some of the changes that were transforming the nation in the late 19th and early 20th century. In history, one event inevitably leads to another, and it's difficult simply to parachute into a topic without the necessary context and background first. For example, it's difficult to understand the World War I age without understanding the in impact the Industrial Revolution had on America. The Industrial Revolution goes back centuries, but if you're looking for a definition, it's power-driven machines that greatly increase production, and that which drives prices down and makes the economy boom. This process had been going on for a couple hundred years, as I say, with uh, wood and water sources of, as power, but it's in the late 19th century when the American economy explodes with new inventions and new power sources. The increase in the use of steel was a major cause of the late 19th century industrial boom. People knew how to make uh, steel from iron. Steel is a stronger metal for, for a long time, but it was a long and laborious process. It was in the 19th century when a guy named Henry Bessemer invented a process of making iron molten and then burning out the impurities, which made steel. And as I say, steel is a stronger metal than iron. Steel mills exploded all throughout areas of America where there was a lot of uh, iron sources. For example, there was a lot of iron and uh, other materials needed to produce steel in western Pennsylvania and, and that the Pittsburgh area. They had a lot of things, uh, burned uh, charcoal called coke, which was a great energy source to make the steel. But if you think of the steel, you probably think of the NFL's Pittsburgh Steelers. It's there because of the, of the steel industry. One of the leaders of the new steel industry was a Scottish immigrant named Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie's famous sort of a ratio alger story, rags to riches. He was born and poor, and you can see him here where he's born with his brother. And he came to America and, and came, uh, when he sold his company, uh, became U.S. Steel. It was the first billion dollar company. If machines were made of steel now, well, electricity was a power source that people were starting to use. Now, electricity has uh, been around, obviously, in nature. And they'd been trying to figure out a way to, to really use it for a long time. Think of Ben Franklin and his famous lightning rod. In the late 19th century America, the guy that really figured out a, a, a way to make electricity useful and was a, somebody you're probably familiar with, Thomas Alva Edison. You can see a picture of him young here on the left and uh, older on the right. You think of Edison inventing the incandescent light bulb, you can see on the right, but he put electricity uh, to use in a lot of new inventions, like the phonograph on the uh, left, and the storage battery, or the dictaphone, and uh, the motion picture camera. Edison started a company, uh, the Edison Electric Illuminating Company, and it's, you can see some of its advertisements here. One of the reasons that people like Edison could start finding practical uses for electricity was they invented ways to uh, create that power source, create electricity. And that in the late 19th century, you have a guy named Charles Parsons, you can see him on the right, who invented a steam turbine, which was able to produce electricity. And they also got electricity from hydroelectric dams. Here you see a picture of uh, Edison's illuminating company laying some of the power lines in New York City for his first customers. The power source that Edison used was direct current, which meant that it, the electricity would go straight from the uh, steam turbine or hydroelectric dam to directly the consumer. The problem was the consumer often didn't need that much electricity. You won't have some ability to divert the electricity off one single line and to control how much electricity flows better. And uh, that, uh, in the late 19th century, led a guy named Nikola Tesla to invent what was called alternating uh, electricity. It allowed electricity to be broken up, go both ways, more control over the power source. And he got together with a guy named George Westinghouse, you can see on the left, to, to uh, form a company. And using the, the uh, AC current, the alternating current, you see they use transformers to, to divert the electricity into various consumers. In 
This led for a wall for competition between Edison and uh, Westinghouse and Tulsa's companies. And uh, that was known as the ACDC Wars, the current wars. Now, as you probably expected, uh, alternating current was a better way to use electricity. And not surprisingly, Westinghouse and Tulsa's company, uh, known as General Electric, uh, won the current wars. Now, besides steel and electricity, obviously another uh, major invention was the early automobile. Now, what drove the invention of the automobiles was the invention of the internal combustion engine. They tried to uh, apply the internal combustion engine to a wagon, and you know, the result was the automobile. Here you see the first automobile to employ an internal combustion engine. One of the captains of the new automobile industry was Henry Ford, who founded the Ford Motor Company. The key to the Ford uh, Motor Company's success was its use of the first assembly line. They, they weren't, as before, just making one car from start to finish and then moving on to the next car. They had a system that used an assembly line. Now you need a source of uh, energy for the internal combustion engine and oil was perfect for that. Now oil, of course, was something that had been around for a really long time in nature. In the medieval days, they'd use boiling oil uh, to dump on invaders. But what, by the 19th century, the early 19th century, they, they started using uh, refined oil as kerosene for lanterns. That replaced like whale oil la lanterns. It was just before the Civil War when people first intentionally started drilling for oil. The guy named Edwin Drake, everybody thought the business model was stupid. It was a Drake's folly. One of the key developments in the late 19th century was the ability to refine the oil differently from kerosene and refine it into gasoline, which was perfect for the internal combustion engine. And then you had a, a leftover product when you, when you had that refinement called asphalt, and that was perfect for roads to keep the, uh, the, early, the early cars moving without getting stuck. The big leader in the oil industry was a man named John D. Rockefeller, which you can see here. He founded the Standard Oil Company, which was perfect for uh, vertical integration if you're a business student. You know, he owned everything. He owned 90% of the entire oil industry by the late 19th, late 19th century. Now, people have been trying to uh, fly, of course, for forever. And uh, in the late 19th century, it, it was only a matter of time before you, so someone started applying a power source to lighter than air travel. And that, of course, leads us to air travel with the famous flight uh, of Orville and Wilbur Wright shown here in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. The uh, motorized plane could fly fast enough to get lift. And uh, they went across the sand dune and uh, you have here the, a, a news story announcing their success. Now, people had already applied steam to uh, create railroads. And in the late 19th century, the Industrial Revolution saw the growth of railroads. It just grew tremendously. And it extended the ability of businesses to acquire the raw materials they needed and to market all the finished products they were now creating. There was cutthroat competition, as you might expect. But some of the uh, leaders were Collis Huntington of the Central Pacific Road on the left. Jay Gould of the Union Pacific Railroad in the middle, and Cornelius Vanderbilt of the New York Central Railroad on the right, who uh, famously, the family famously started Vanderbilt University. Now, all the railroad growth and consolidation in the late 19th century was really important because it contributed to a standardized track gauge or standardized width that made a national integrated system of railroads possible. There were other inventions as well in the late 19th century. Here you can see clockwise from the top left, the automatic couplers that the train car hold train cars together. And they were really important were new air brakes to slow trains. And all this sort of led to a coordinated system of railroad signals. Now, because the Industrial Revolution required considerable capital for investment, the number and size of corporations and banks grew. The New York Stock Exchange exploded. Now, at left, you can see the New York Stock Exchange 
earlier uh, in the 19th century. And then in, you can, on the right, you can see the building uh, that was replaced it in 1903, and it's, it's obviously much bigger and, and is still used today. Now, small standalone bank, and you can see one at the top left here. They've been uh, very common in the late 19th century, but now in the, in the late Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, you start seeing uh, large multi-branch banks, and that means they have considerably more capital to the loan. John Pierpont Morgan, who you may know as J.P. Morgan, you can see a picture of him young on the left and older on the right, was the big uh, winner in the... Uh, the banking business. He's probably the greatest financier uh, in the Industrial Revolution. His company, matter of fact, still exists as J.P. Morgan Chase uh, Bank today. And you can see that in the bottom right. All of this innovation and industry quickly transformed America into an economic superpower. By the turn of the 20th century, the United States was the number one manufacturing country in the world, outpacing the next two countries, Britain and Germany, combined. Not surprising, uh, the late 19th century industrial growth led to the growth of cities. Here you can see some of the, uh, how big cities were getting by the late 19th century. Before the Civil War, if you go into cities, the brick and mortar buildings, they could only rise up about four or five stories because the weight of the brick and the mortar would crush the one below. And also you wouldn't want to walk up the, you know, too many flights of stairs. Of course, with uh, steel and electricity, the Industrial Revolution in the late 19th century saw cities uh, building up more because you get things like uh, elevators and uh, steel girders and plated glass. Of course, all the new urban den density meant it was difficult to get people around and not surprising, you started seeing things like in the early uh, 20th century, the New York City subway. Now, America has always been a nation of immigrants, but with its tremendous economic growth, it's sort of admired throughout the world in the late 19th century, immigrants flooded America's large cities, transforming the nature of these cities. On the top left here, you can see the number of immigrants uh, on the uh, axis there, up between 9 million immigrants in early, by 1910 or so. Almost all of the new immigrants were poor. They, they saw America as the land of opportunity. A guy uh, was a, a writer named Horatio Alger, and he always wrote of books of uh, people poor and coming here and making, making a lot of money. And that was America's reputation. It was land of opportunity. And so here you see a picture of them pouring in. Of course, you already know this because uh, it's the Statue of Liberty was given us to us in the late 19th century by France as a gift. It was it was constructed in in pieces in France. You can see on the left, and then transported to uh, the New York Harbor on the right. Now, as I say, America has always been a land of poor immigrants. But uh, the thing was, in the late 19th century, these immigrants were different. They came from a different place. Before, most immigrants to the United States had been from northern and western Europe, which you can see in uh, the graph here in red. In the late 19th century, a lot of these poor immigrants started coming from southern and eastern Europe, places like Russia and Poland and uh, the Balkans. And you can see the years going from the, the top left to the bottom right. Uh, the number of southern eastern Europeans began to outstrip the number of traditional northern and western Europeans and look at the bottom the bottom left there. Now of course these eastern and southern Europeans had uh, different religions and you started seeing things uh, like Greek Orthodox or uh, Muslim and here you know they have they have a completely different culture they not only look different but they they have a different culture. For example, you can see the Cyrillic alphabet in the top left here. Now, these, these people arrived and they looked different and, and had different cultures. So not surprisingly, they, they hung together. They, they uh, wanted to work in the opportunity and the only opportunity was in factories in these big cities. Thing is, they, they faced a lot of discrimination and, and they really, this, this hurt their ability to assimilate. And the end result was these new immigrants settled together in their own ethnic communities in their city of arrival, meaning places like New York mainly. 
Because the factories were located in these cities, the immigrants provided the necessary labor for the economic boom. American immigration policy at this time was basically open borders. There was some uh, Chinese exclusion legislation. But if you were coming, uh, America would have you. The thing is, they needed to be processed and they needed to be checked for diseases. And so uh, this was the heyday, uh, famously, of Ellis Island, which is kind of cool if you ever go to New York City. Uh, as you take the uh, the ferry out to Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty, Liberty at Battery Park. Now, all this economic growth created a, a new class of super wealthy. America has obviously always had wealthy, but most before they were uh, things like large plantations. What happened in the late 19th century was we start seeing a degree of wealth that America really hadn't seen before. And as part of all the uh, Industrial Revolution, they, they really have elaborate homes with all the new inventions. This is uh, a super class. Now, the, uh, the companies this, this class of super wealthy people created, uh, that meant they had jobs for, for all the bureaucrats that were required to run this, this, these big companies. And that, that meant new, like I say, management jobs in these corporate bureaucracies. There are a whole bunch of office workers, and you can see them below on the right. They became known as white-collar workers because they wore white shirts with ties. And uh, so that we're creating this super class of wealthy, but we're also seeing a, a new middle class grow and benefit from the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution's new middle class would have things like uh, all the you know early electrical appliances, like a sewing Singer sewing machine, or and they'd have indoor plumbing, hot and cold running water. You begin to see uh, companies making a lot of canned foods. Uh, sold so widespread. Of course, people would live densely in cities, but the new middle class, they they could afford new homes and out outside the city, and uh, that led to the first suburbs. It's what's interesting is you can see the 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 wealthiest people would always have. Uh, like uh, the medieval day, the, the Lord would have a castle in the middle of, the middle of his land. All the land would would be around it. Well, in the city, you couldn't have that. And as the, the new middle class began to sort of uh, flout its wealth, they began to move their houses back. So uh, they have front yards. And eventually, when you get further out in the suburbs, you start seeing houses that kind of have a manor around it, a yard that wasn't used for production. Now, what allowed these this new emergent middle class to live out in the suburbs was better transportation. You started having electric streetcars connecting sur suburbanites to the inner urban core. You know, it's, in, in general, the Industrial Revolution of the late 19th century really made the nation as a whole much more mobile, traveling and, and communicating much easier. For example, traveling by railroad, uh, they had this company, the Pull, Pullman's Palace car company, which had the first sleeping car. And it, you know, they had a, it started having a, a food car, and, and it's, it's not like it used to be. Henry Ford in the early 1900s, of course, produced his Model T. It's mass produced, and it uh, drove the price down. And what it did was it made the car affordable for this middle class, for most people. Uh, it's not just cars before it existed, but they, they were uh, it's only for the super wealthy and rare. And now these Model Ts are everywhere. It wasn't just in older large cities where economic growth exploded, transforming American life. When oil took off, it created sudden boom towns where oil was underground. Oil particularly led to a boom in places like Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, but I'm not telling you anything new. Now, not all was good in the booming economy. The pressure to compete led to monopolies, while the failure of the money supply to keep pace with all the production drove up interest rates for borrowing and credit. Now, this not only hurt farmers, who borrowed cyclically according to the agricultural harvest, but it also eventually led to a consolidation of wealth at the top even more so. There were relatively few regulatory laws. Standard Oil, for example, formed a mass of what they called trust, buying up other corporations, in effect, killing competition. Above, you can see a cartoon uh, that depicts Standard Oil as a, 
of octopus just grabbing everything around it. By the 1890s, as I say, Standard Oil dominated 90 percent of the oil industry. But you got to understand that understand that it, how critical oil was to the gr uh, growing industrial revolution economy. Now, without regulation, there was widespread corruption, and the late 19th century had a number of famous scandals. One of the scandals was because the Credit Mobiler scandal involved the railroad industry. Another scandal was in the alcohol industry, the famous whiskey ring scandal. There was the, the infamous Black Friday uh, gold conspiracy after the Civil War. You get a couple of guys, Jim Fisk, you see him on the left, and Jay Gould on the right. What they tried to do was corner the gold market, buy up all the gold, drive the price up, and then dump it. Wealthy men controlled local government to their own advantage and became known as political bosses, who you've probably heard of before. William Marcy Tweed, you can see him on the top left here, he controlled New York City politics from his headquarters at a place called Tammany Hall, and, and there's a picture of Tam Tammany Hall there in the middle. All the presidents in the late 19th century, and you can see them here in order clockwise from top to left, were conservative Republicans, the lone exception Grover Cleveland, and Grover Cleveland only marginally favored reform. Now the economy's booming, nothing seems uh, really wrong to, to government, and uh, so both parties, but especially the Republicans, they favored a, a laissez-faire federal policy, that the hands-off, anti-regulatory, anti-tech policies. They believed that what was good for business was good for America. And so uh, it, we're booming and just lay off it. Don't regulate it. Don't tax it. Incidentally, it was about this time that a political cartoonist, Thomas Nast, who you can see on the left here, depicted Democrats as donkeys and Republicans as elephants, which, of course, are the symbols that remain today. Given that laissez-faire meant little government protection, industrial workers were exploited and, and lived miserable lives, not surprisingly. All of these southern eastern European immigrants are pouring into these cities, and uh, they, they devalued themselves, and, and they, were, they looked different, they had a different culture, and there was a lot of racism. And so not surprisingly, in a laissez-faire environment, their lives really sucked. In an age of laissez-faire, the factory workers, uh, they worked incredibly long hours and uh, were paid low wages, barely, barely enough, if that, to live. Women were exploited even worse, paid less than the meager salaries of the men, and often facing sexual harassment. Because child labor was cheaper, Child labor was common, unfortunately, especially in the mines. The, the young kids could get up in the crevices where the uh, adults could not. No matter where you worked, it was probably dangerous in the factory. There were no regulations, but no safety standards. The cities where they lived and worked were, had these coal plants burning uh, and, and producing pollution everywhere that just hung over the city. There's a picture of a dead horse decaying where a couple of kids are playing next to it. These southern eastern European immigrants and their ethnic communities just uh, flooded into what became tenement houses, backs of old houses sold and uh, you know poorly built and aging uh, apartment buildings that didn't have any of the new amenities. And uh, without safety standards, they just poured in, sharing their rent. So when you think of the late 19th century in America, the booming economy, the industrial age we've been talking about, they're both winners and losers, you know. Uh, not everything is great. And as a matter of fact, the famous writer Mark Twain, you can see him on the top left here, referred to uh, the late 19th century, the dichotomy between super wealthy and super poor, as the gilded age. All that glitters is not gold. Of course, the Industrial Revolution was not just the United States. In Britain, a Russian named Karl Marx during this time, of course, saw what was happening to Britain and said these poor people aren't going to take it much longer. And uh, he's famous, of course, for creating the uh, philosophy of communism. The Industrial Revolution wasn't much better for farmers than it was for factory workers in the cities. 
farmers would go into debt to purchase the new agricultural machines, you know, the things the Industrial Revolution was producing and they needed, things like tractors. And uh, with these, all these inventions like tractors, they would produce more and, and have more profit. Unfortunately, they outstripped demand. They produced so much that the prices they got for their crops actually dropped. Here you can see uh, prices of profits or losses for the agricultural industry. Uh, the index on the left and the years at the bottom. The blue represents profit, but as the year goes along, you can see in the late 19th century all that red, all that, uh, that debt that farmers were incurring because of the Industrial Revolution, even as they produce more and more. Now, the railroad industry had grown, but still, if you're out in the middle of the of agricultural area, you're probably not near a railroad. And if one was near, there wasn't any competition. And again, we live in a uh, laissez-faire world at this time. And so there were no regulations of the railroad. And, and, and railroad owner could just say, charge you whatever he wanted. It was a monopoly. Here you see a cartoon. Uh, there's the capital in the background, and Lady Liberty represents the farmers. And the snake, which has Monopoly written on it, is threatening her. Meanwhile, Uncle Sam in the back left is being uh, distracted by somebody, uh, a little man who's obviously wealthy in the way he's dressed. In the early 1890s, activist farmers who'd begun to form alliances began to recruit disgruntled laborers into a new political party dubbed the People's Party. You know, farmers and workers, we're the real people of America. And so this alliance of farmers and workers, uh, both groups hurt by the Industrial Revolution, became known as the Populist Movement. The Populist Movement in the late 19th century in reaction to the Industrial Revolution was the most famous populist movement. There have been a lot of populist movement. It's a, any movement to sort of advance the interest of the common people against a perceived corrupt and powerful elite. And of course, in recent years, we've had uh, the uh, Tea Party and, and uh, Donald Trump's candidacy in many ways is a reflection of uh, American populist sentiment. The populist movement at this time uh, in the late 19th century, the famous populist movement, ultimately failed because it, it split any hope for reform. Some reformers would vote populist and others democratic. The cartoon to the left depicts farmers stealing the Democratic Party represented by the donkey. The problems of the Industrial Revolution remain, therefore, and, and it you know what's going to happen is it's going to lead to a new, a broader reform movement known as the Progressive Movement. It lasted from the 1890s through the end of World War I. Now, part of, of course, the new progressive movement was the old populist coalition of farmers and workers. On the left, you can see a protest rally of farmers. Now, on the right, you can see one of the feistiest labor advocates, a woman named Mary Harris Jones, and became uh, popularly known as Mother Jones. She's all fired up. Now, the progressive movement was more than just the old coalition of farmers and workers, those aggrieved by the Industrial Revolution, the losers. In the progressive era of the early 20th century, the middle class joined the movement for reform. Now, you say, you might think, well, why would the middle class join the movement for reform? Because I thought they were living in those nice uh, suburbs and had all the new appliances and all. They were the, they were the bureaucrats, the white collar workers. Why would they be demanding reform? Well, part of the reason was, was the uh, these businesses were not only pressuring their workers, but they were also ripping off the consumers. The products were not safe, and uh, they were often dangerous. You didn't know really what you were getting. There's no no thing against false advertising, and so you know the middle class is buying all these products, and and they're demanding consumer protections. They've demanded the government reform. The middle class was also becoming aware of just how bad the poor factory workers in the in the inner city core, how they how, how badly they lived. And part of that reason is because they were the middle class was the newspaper readers. And uh, they were beginning to have exposés, sensationalist journalism uh, that called people's attention to how bad parts of society and the economy were. Theodore Roosevelt, who I'm going to talk about here in a minute termed uh, this sort of sensationalist journalism muckrakers. They would rake up the muck from the 
the bottom of scandal, and uh, you can see him here look, doing that. But the thing is, muckraking journalism did intimidate, keep people honest in uh, public office. They were going to expose some of the true inequities and problems of the progressive age, the problems of the Industrial Revolution. Now, unlike the populist movement, the progressive movement didn't form a, a national party at the outset. Rather, it was a bottoms-up, grassroots movement. Local, uncoordinated reforms gave way to state reforms, and ultimately, as people coalesced in, uh, politically, into a national party. So it progressed from uncoordinated, not really co uh, communicating, connecting with each other at the local level, to I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine at the state level, we get more bang, reform bang for our buck, to ultimately, late in progressive era, you start seeing national reform. Here you can see on the right a cartoon depicting reform, shown here as Lady Liberty sweeping across America. So if the progressive movement was initially uncoordinated and disjointed at the local and then later state level, what well, can we say united them in, in retrospect? You know, why were they progressive? What, 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 why were they, how were they alike? Well, all progressive reformers were optimistic. They believed that solutions to problems were possible. They, they weren't fatalistic or pessimistic. Indeed, the word progress is inherent in the progressive movement. They had faith that the government could improve the situation. So they're kind of looking to elites. They, the progressive era's reformers based their optimism that the government would be full of experts and, and there's a real faith, a faith in expertise. You know, if, if one looked at the problem as it actually was and not as it, they wished it were, and then used uh, his or her rational thinking abilities, you could have a, a solution. It may not make it perfect, but it, it could still improve a problem. So it's during the progressive age you start seeing the codification of a number of professions like the American Medical Association or the American Bar Association. We're codifying expertise and then putting faith in those experts. So what were some of the areas of reform? Well, education was a major focus for social reformers. One such reform was the creation of preschool education, which they had in Germany and was known as kindergarten. Educational reformers changed curricula. It would often be like a classical uh, education, and, and they began to focus more on practical, real-world applications of, uh, of, for students. In lieu of the old one-room schoolhouse, all the grades in one, one room, you're seeing the uh, consolidation into larger school districts. And uh, of course, that was made possible by the automobile. You can see these states wanting to uh, improve education. So we, we need to make sure that our teachers know what the hell they're doing. And so states began to form what they call normal schools to train teachers. And uh, of course, uh, Oklahoma became a state during the progressive age and Southeastern Oklahoma State University was originally a uh, Southeastern normal school. And in fact, education still key to the, uh, the school today. Besides education, another area that was ripe for reform was uh, mental health. Now, if people had uh, some mental health issues before, they were often just labeled as sane and insane, you know, and if you were insane, there's no help for you. You're just put away in an asylum and these asylums could be brutal. And But, you know, rather than go to a lunatic asylum shown in this slide, you would go in classic progressive form to an expert on the mind. This is the really growth of the psychiatric uh, in psychology fields. Here you can see the American Psychological Association was founded uh, at this time. But the idea of therapy, both medicinally and, uh, and through talk therapy, is growing. People are not just sane and insane. And if you have mental health issues, there's uh, hope. Now, cities were kind of nasty and uh, crowded, and, and a, a movement for reform began in the, in the cities to make it 
more beautiful. And a lot of this known as the, the city beautiful movement was the idea that if you plant trees along roads and plan parks and have wider streets and buildings that are ornamentally attractive, what that does is it improves public, it improves public virtue. It makes the city a nicer place. And it was during this uh, late 19th century when you see Frederick Law Olmsted, who's shown on the left here, who famously designed and built New York City's Central Park. Imagine New York City without Central Park. With all the uh, improvements in uh, domestic appliances, many middle class women had more time on their hands. And uh, they were aware as middle class that of the problems in the inner cities. And so they, they formed their own uh, reform movement to help uh, spread virtue among the poor immigrants. This movement became known as the Settlement House Movement. And uh, it's, it, it, uh, the, these women would form these settlement houses and live there. And then these poor women from the surrounding neighborhoods would come there and they'd learn skills and uh, high culture and they'd, there'd be things like early daycare. They would help them with hygiene and, and in general uh, help them assimilate these poor natives. The idea for a settlement house movement actually was in the Industrial Revolution and started in Britain, but a woman named Jane Adams took that concept and went to Chicago and uh, found it what became famous as the Hall House. And the Hall House was a real inspiration sort of for middle class women throughout the country. And you see these settlement houses in the progressive age popping up all over cities and across the United States. Hall House grew pretty big. You can see what it looks like here on the, uh, at one point on, on the left. Well, another area for progressive reformers was criminal justice. And again, an area that was rife for reform. Uh, if you were convicted of a crime, there was really no incentive to behave well in prison. There was uh, no effort to uh, keep you from going out and coming back in, recidivism, uh, to you know, to get the root causes. It was just brutal. Was, and, and, you know, there was no idea, no, no different treatment for, for young people than old people. And uh, it, it's, it's an area ripe for reform. Well, it's during the progressive age when you start seeing the idea of parole, which, uh, you know, you supervise release early uh, to help the person acclimate and keep an eye on them. And you also see things like juvenile court and uh, indeterminate sentences, like how long you in for, five to ten. Well, that was, uh, again, a, a way to, uh, to encourage good behavior. Now, during the progressive age, there, there was a growth of conservation and preservation because cities and suburbs were growing across the country and people were losing natural world. Well, preservationists wanted to keep everybody out. It was just this value in nature. But conservationists worried that the growth of the American economy would uh, make us run out of resources like uh, wood or water. And, uh, but either one of these, preservationists or uh, conservationists, were not look, just looking at land to be exploited. And uh, they began in this period to look uh, legal for legal reform, uh, political protections against the indiscriminate exploitation of the natural world by industry. Yet another area for reform was the political corruption I'd mentioned. And in response, you begin to see things like uh, citizen initiatives or where ordinary citizens could propose laws for consideration by their state legislature, or the referendum uh, procedure where citizens could vote directly uh, whether they approve personal laws, or of course the recall. We don't like what we, we voted into office, we're going to vote them out early. There was simply uh, the idea of a secret ballot, so everybody didn't know how you voted. That was something that originally come from Australia, or at least was known as the Australian ballot. Now one area that attracted uh, reformers in the political realm was the direct election of senators. At this time, each state's two senators weren't elected directly by the, the people. They voted for the congressmen, but the senators were elected by state legislatures. And so the, often these senators uh, were, were more susceptible to some of these political bosses. And uh, you get people saying, well, heck, why don't we vote for senators as well as state reps, and that would make them less likely to be bought off or whatnot. 
Other reformers looked for things like public health campaigns. They they thought that well we can improve the city if we build a you know, a, a better uh, sewer system or, or water system or and uh, you see air, air more intensified public efforts to to fight uh, epidemics. Now there were a lot of disagreements between reformers and uh, you see this in the debate over Victorian culture. Victorian culture is named for the British Queen Victoria, shown on the left here. And it was a very staid, sort of uh, hierarchical culture based on morals and, and rules. Everyone had set expectations and a genteelness. And uh, this whole idea of Victorian culture was controversial. Now, some people worried that Victorian culture was was fading and they and they wanted to get reform to protect it and others thought that that change was good and and they actually fought reformed get the government to uh, encourage change for example the industrial revolution had led to uh, saw this baldy theater you know, became properly known as vaudeville and you know it was it could often be crude and overtly sexual and a lot of the uh, a lot of reformers wanted to get rid of that and get the government to outlaw it. Now, of course, the, related to the, the the temperance movement had been around for a while, and uh, it was growing in the late 19th century. And you see groups like the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the, the uh, WCTU, they began to have a, you know, a, a, a very broad-based reform movement to outlaw alcohol. As I say, Victorian culture had a lot of expectations and norms and uh, not surprisingly, Victorian culture saw women as, as the upholders of virtue in society. Uh, and they, they were not rough and tumble and, and, uh, like men. And so uh, it's not surprising that, that women were the ones leading the temperance movement. Lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours, says this picture. Now, while there were groups like the Women's Christian Temperance Union sort of worried about the spread of Victorian culture, wanting reform to block it, other women, often younger women, they saw this period in need of equal protection for women, legally, socially, economically, culturally. And they were fighting for the right to vote. And uh, Alice Paul, who was an activist here, you can see her on the left, and she helped form the National Women's Party about this time. The idea over women voting challenged Victorian norms. Another women's rights uh, reformer was Margaret Sanger, who fought for the ability of women to uh, have birth control. Now, you know, more Victorian culture saw pregnancy and sex as something for the marriage. And, and uh, if you're going to have sex, you're going to have children. That was the point of it. And Margaret Sanger was saying what happens is women are seen as inferior. And when they get married, uh, they sort of are, are are having to get pregnant over and over and over again, and they they need to have more control over their bodies and say whether to have children. So she began to advocate for legalized female birth control, and uh, that was really a challenge to Victorian culture. Well, Margaret Sanger founded the first birth control clinic in America, had a journal, the Birth Control Review, and uh, later her organization would evolve into a, an organization that's still controversial today, Planned Parenthood. The progressive sentiment for progress through expertise led some reformers to advocate eugenics and the attempt to control evolution and thus weed out undesirable human traits and diseases. And so if you have some mental health issue or, I mean, or, or whatever, a physical issue that was genetic, they would keep you from reproducing. Now, eugenics is pretty ugly and, uh, you know, another ugly aspect of the progressive age was uh, the status of African Americans. At this time, what were known as Jim Crow laws were dominant throughout the South, and that, of course, was segregation laws. Now, you might think that if uh, progressives are sort of do-gooders looking to reform problems, they would see the unfair Jim Crow laws as an area for reform. In fact, progressives were 
products of their generation and they were racist and they assumed that African Americans were inferior. And uh, so if you empowered people that were genetically inferior or culturally inferior, you were hurting, not helping society. And so that that was something that reformers were trying to improve society and empowering African Americans was in their racist view doing just the opposite. Well, these segregation laws, these Jim Crow laws were upheld in the infamous Plessy versus Ferguson case in 1895. And, uh, you know, separate but equal uh, was the principle and it codified Jim Crow and, and that racism until this until Martin Luther King's day. Now at this time there was the, the Republican laissez-faire conservative President of the United States uh, William McKinley still in office and the 1900 election was coming and he was very worried about getting reelected. He was aware that that you know, more and more Republicans were starting to even vote for reform. The Democratic Party by this time was very reformist. And he, he wanted to get reelected, but he's sort of pro-business laissez-faire. Well, what he decided to do was to find a, a, one of the few Republican governors who advocated reform to run as his vice presidential candidate. And McKinley assumed that once elected, he, McKinley, as president, would have all the power and can still defeat all the reforms. And McKinley decided that he was going to choose the popular reformist New York governor, Theodore Roosevelt. Here you can see some of the uh, campaign, uh, a picture of the two of them, and one of the items from the campaign. Well, the, the plan worked, and the McKinley-Roosevelt Republican ticket won in the 1900 election. Well, unfortunately for McKinley, in 1901, he was assassinated, and that meant that the progressive Roosevelt was president. Well, now national progressivism, which again had grown from the local level and coordinated the state level, was now at the national level, and it, it had its champion in the White House. So you're going to have a lot of uh, a, a lot of national reform coming. Roosevelt's famous not only for, for uh, force of, of having reformist uh, administration, but also by being very powerful in the, using the power of the presidency. He was a a, a tremendous public speaker really uh, was an you know a, a, an impressive guy and a gregarious outgoing guy. He saw to call his uh, reform his reform program a square deal. He was going to offer the average guy a square deal, and that meant that the government was going to get involved. There's the laissez faire is over with. Roosevelt filed a number of antitrust suits, breaking up monopolies. When coal workers went on strike in 1902, uh, Roosevelt used his presidential power to sort of uh, mediate that dispute. And no president had gotten the federal government involved in a labor management dispute before. And so uh, when the federal government gets involved, then big business is probably going to be more willing to uh, make concessions. And indeed, out of Roosevelt's intervention, there were concessions for, for uh, workers. It was during Roosevelt's presidency they created a new department that was a sort of a regulatory department. It was the Department of Commerce and Labor. Now, of course, these two departments later grew and split. But here you see a picture of Roosevelt with his cabinet in the top right. Remember those railroad monopolies I was talking about? Well, it was Roosevelt who got the Hepburn Act 1906 passed, which began the federal government's regulation of railroad rates. And uh, railroads, of course, went from state to state, interstate commerce, and thus the, the federal government obviously had jurisdiction. Remember the middle class? They, uh, they were the consumers demanding consumer protection laws? Well, it was during Roosevelt's presidency we get the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. <clears throat> it basically meant you couldn't sell foods and drugs that uh, were bad, bad for, for consumers and began the idea of, of regulation. Roosevelt promoted conservation and, and preservation. He uh, had a number of dams built, which uh, conservationists 
uh, liked, and he also used the Antiquities Act of 1906, which was meant to sort of have to protect areas of historical value, to protect areas of natural beauty. And he he uh, used that power and created uh, five national parks, wildlife refuges, and and uh, you know national through national monument legislation. Well, in 1908, President Roosevelt decided he wasn't going to run again, and he selected William Howard Taft to be his uh, Republican successor. Taft had served as a judge, as the governor of the territory of the Philippines, and as a secretary of war, so he was well qualified. And uh, Roosevelt just expected Taft to continue his reform agenda. With Roosevelt's support, Taft won the Republican nomination and ultimately defeated the Democratic nominee William Jennings Bryan in the 1908 election. Here you can see the, the GOP's convention in Chicago in 1908. Four years later, after Taft had not pushed reform as much as he would have liked, Roosevelt decided to challenge the incumbent Taft for the 1912 Republican nomination. This is the cartoon. You can see Roosevelt looking in and Taft sitting there and he's, he's all screwed up. But of course, Taft had the big, big business money by this point, and, uh, and the power of the incumbency, of course. So when Taft is is maybe challenged by the popular Republican, Taft still won, and uh, Roosevelt's not a wilting flower, and so he decides that he's if he can't get the Republican nomination, he's gonna run in the 1912 general election as a as a independent, a third party, and he he called this party the Progressive Party. Now Roosevelt, as I said, was very outgoing and was often uh, joked as a, a you know a bull moose, and uh, not not surprisingly, the Progressive Party soon became known as the Bull Moose Party. Now the 1912 uh, Democrats were looking for a new fresh face, and uh, and when they met in Baltimore, you can see it above, they selected New Jersey Governor Woodrow Wilson, and you can see him on the right. And Wilson, as a Democrat, was a re reformer. Of course, uh, Wilson's the president that's going to be president when World War I uh, is fought. But uh, suffice to say at this point that Wilson was a much different person than Roosevelt. I said uh, Roosevelt was forceful, sort of heavy set, outgoing, gregarious. Uh, Wilson's thin. Uh, he's uh, reserved, very moralistic. Uh, and he, uh, son of a, a minister, and he's going to go on and get a doctorate uh, and be the first president with a uh, PhD. So when Roosevelt's third party challenge split the Republican vote, Woodrow Wilson won uh, the election in 1912. Wilson was the first Democrat to hold the presidency other than Grove and Cleveland, which I mentioned briefly in passing, uh, since, geez, the, uh, before the Civil War. So the Industrial Revolution is just profoundly important. It transforms everything. Uh, but it did more than just transform the economy and politics. It, it even transformed American foreign policy. Now, to understand this, you got to understand that for much of the 19th century, the Monroe Doctrine had defined American foreign policy, the policy of isolationism, you know, a concern with only the Western Hemisphere. By 1912, by the presidencies of McKinley, Roosevelt, and Taft, however, America's isolationism had begun to fade as a certain jingoism emerged, a, a sense that America was great and should expand. This led to a new phase in American foreign policy known as imperialism, where the United States controlled other people and lands for its own benefit. So this shift from isolationism to imperialism as a result of the Industrial Revolution is quite profound. Here you see a cartoon of uh, you know, Uncle Sam riding the backs of uh, an, another a citizen from another land. Now, one reason for this, this shift in foreign policy was the improved transportation with the Industrial Revolution. Faster and larger steamships just, in effect, so dramatically reduced the time it took to go from continent to continent across the oceans, so much so that it made the world appear smaller. Now people actually could influence events abroad, and events abroad could influence, uh, you know, events here. And uh, businesses began to look abroad for raw materials and and new markets. By the way, it's it's this time in 1912 where the the famous Titanic took place, and that's an example of how traveling just isn't like it used to be.
it was during the progressive age where you see uh, improved communications with transatlantic traffic and uh that's you you're going to see things like uh insulated uh telegraph wires across the oceans and that soon gave way to uh wireless communication and again back to titanic you're probably familiar with the wireless communication but you know it transportation communication out of the industrial revolution is just making the world smaller so yeah you know, here's the american business looking to uh for new markets and <clears throat> and also new raw, raw materials uh for example rubber in africa which is shown here uh the u.s government kind of wants to encourage american business and so they sought to advance, use the power of the government to advance the interest of Americans around the globe. This imperialism may not be pretty, but America wasn't uh, alone. All the modern industrial powers in Western Europe and elsewhere were looking to have markets and the sources of raw materials. And uh, so if we don't get a piece of the pie now in the undeveloped, non-aligned part of the world, mineral rich and market ready to be exploited, if we don't get a piece of that slice of pie now, our competitor nations will. So you have to keep up. Uh, you got to keep up with the Joneses, otherwise you're going to lose. And here you can see a map of the various colonial empires. Look at the, the countries in, in Western Europe and you can see their colonies in, around the world. And, Again, uh, we'll talk about the United States joining joining these nations. Another thing contributing to the idea of imperialism was the closing of the Western frontier. You know, a sense that uh, well, we could we weren't really always concerned about the about the uh, world abroad because we had plenty more on our plate anyway. I mean, we had the entire West to settle on all of its raw materials. Well, the West is closed, and so if you don't keep growing, you're probably going to start dying. A growing sense of American exceptionalism, you know, manifest destiny uh, grew in America. And, and uh, you know, it's uh, we're, we're God's people and and uh, we're, we're different and it's good for us to spread. And that gets in a, you know, in a close closely with social Darwinism, the idea that, we're, you know, it's it's weed out the weak. America's first significant imperialist venture was in 1898 during the presidency of William McKinley and involved Cuba, 90 miles from Key West and then still a colony of Spain. When in the late 1890s, the Cubans began to rebel, the Spanish were brutal in their suppression. Here you can see a picture uh, of, of some of the, uh, the punishments. In America, the jinguist newspapers, sometimes called yellow journalism, such as the Hearst papers, and you can see some of them here, they began to drum up support for intervention, stoking anger at the Spanish. When an American naval ship, the United States ship Maine, USS Maine, provocatively docked in Havana Harbor, exploded under questionable circumstances, the imperialists and the, and, and the American government had their excuse to intervene. American businesses began to advocate intervention because they realized huge profits from Cuba's extensive production of sugar, tobacco, fruits, and oil. Well, Congress declared war, the launching the what's known as American Spanish American War, and very quickly the United States won, and and they won a bounty of new territories by defeating the Spanish. Here you can see a a picture of the of a newspaper de, uh, declaring the war was out. The United States won de facto control over a so-called independent Cuba. And in the Treaty of Paris, ending the war between America and Spain, the United States got the Philippines as well as Puerto Rico and Guam. The United States also officially annexed Hawaii in July 1898. The Filipinos, led by Emilio Aquinaldo, had been resisting Spanish colonization and initially welcomed American intervention. Once they realized, however, that the U.S. was not going to grant them independence, that it was just simply a new sheriff in town, they began resisting the United States. Now, the United States, not surprisingly, crushed them. Uh, and keep in mind that, you know, what are these Filipinos fighting for? They're fighting for Filipino, Philippines independence, and they're fighting Americans. So this isn't pretty. This isn't a... Uh, 
uh, the best period in American American history. Also during McKinley's presidency, China was undeveloped and rich in minerals. And uh, China is not just some small country, and so it was uh, a great potential market. Well, not surprisingly, numerous countries uh, had realized this, and in, uh, by the late 1890s, it carved out sort of niches of colonial control, and you can see the key on the left here and the map there. Late to the matter of, of China, the United States didn't have its own port, and so the United States wanted a piece of that action and uh, declared what became famous as the open door policy. All colonizing industrial nations should not prevent others from trading with China. You know, most of these countries didn't want the United States muscling in on, on their port, but they didn't want to go to war with the United States. And, and so they agreed, and this became, uh, offered the United States a sort of a door to, to China. And the only person that they didn't really talk about were the only people they didn't really talk about were the Chinese. I mean, what, what did they have to say about this? Only the Chinese protested, which you can see in this uh, cartoon on the left. Well, that these the imperial powers aren't going to allow any any long uh, protest. A huge international force, including the United States, to quickly subdued the subsequent Boxer Rebellion, as they called it, and uh, they created they created a, a puppet Chinese government. They maintained. Not surprisingly, after McKinley, Teddy Roosevelt was the prototypical American imperialist. TR, as he uh, liked to be called, read and was influenced by Captain Alfred T. Mann's famous book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, and you can see a copy of it here. You know, it, uh, Mann argued that it didn't really matter what colonies a country had if they couldn't trade with those colonies. You, you, the, the real uh, jugular was, was the seas, who controlled the ships on the sea. And so uh, the United States should build up a, a strong military power, otherwise it, could, it wouldn't matter. They wouldn't have control of colonies. Well, Roosevelt read it and he agreed that the United States needs to build up its fleet. And it, it built a, a, a massive uh, number of what's called dreadnoughts, these uh, modern battleships made of iron, powered with steam and electricity, rotating turrets. And he uh, painted it white, uh, and white was supposedly the peacetime color of American ships. Uh, and this became known as the Great White Fleet. Well, T.R. then sent the Great White Fleet to circumnavigate the world. You know, they each port throughout the world they went into, they're massive. And, uh, you know, the United States says the purpose is simply to greet the world, but it's kind of quietly... Uh, a world with sort of showing uh, power, uh, you know. Hey, I just want peace. And they see this, they see this armada out in out in their bay, and they think, Hey, man, I want peace too. You know, it's sort of a, a calling card that America has arrived. Don't mess with me. The Great White Fleet is an example of the famous quote that T.R. Uh, attributed T.R. Speak softly, but carry a big stick. Roosevelt wanted to build a canal across the Isthmus of Panama, but the country of Colombia, which controlled it, wouldn't strike a deal with it Roosevelt thought was okay. So, not surprisingly, Teddy Roosevelt encouraged the Panamanians to revolt and used the Great White Fleet to intimidate the Colombians. When Panama claimed independence, TR recognized the new nation and struck a deal with the new government that, of course, strongly favored the Americans. The United States quickly went to work building the canal, and it was quite a project, uh, especially for, uh, you know, at, at its time. Hundreds died building it, and uh, it used more concrete than ever before, and at the time had the world's largest electric generators to move the locks that were necessary. When TR visited the construction of the site, he became the first United States sitting president to leave the country. And here's a picture of them on some of the uh, construction equipment there. Roosevelt's in white. The Panama Canal finally opened World War One and just transformed uh, navigation. Teddy Roosevelt also wanted the United States to have a stronger influence in the Caribbean, in Central America, South America, the Western Hemisphere. 
Now, you may recall that the Monroe Doctrine had told Europe to stay out of the Western Hemisphere, and the Western Hemisphere Americans would stay out of Europe, you know, the, the famous Monroe Doctrine. Well, Roosevelt is going to use the Monroe Doctrine as a justification to get the United States uh, more involved to America's benefit in the Caribbean. And uh, he's going to create what became known as the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. A corollary is when you add something. So what Roosevelt would say would say uh, we can't have two small Central American countries fighting because Europe will use that as an excuse to come in and settle the dispute. You know, you know we Americans need to keep our house in order to keep the Europeans out. Well, you know, when you talk about Americans keeping their house in order, what you're referring to is the United States naval power. And uh, so the U.S. became, as they, be, uh, many people said, the policeman of the Caribbean, always ruling in favor of the United States. The Roosevelt administration launched a period of, you know, decades of U.S. interventions into the Caribbean nations. You can see in this map, each point is a, a spot where Americans either economically or militarily were involved. Yankee go home, they, <laughs> they would say. At that time, uh, Russia was fighting Japan in uh, the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05. Roosevelt's going to negotiate a treaty to that. And uh, when Japan won, it was the first time a, an Asian nation had ever defeated a, Euro was a European nation. But Roosevelt is going to use the negotiations to advance America's interest. He invited the leaders of Russia and Japan to Portsmouth and uh, negotiate what became known as the Treaty of Portsmouth. And because Japan had won, Roosevelt kind of the treaty sort of gave Japan real dominance in northern uh, Pacific. But part of that treaty also sort of implied that America was dominant in the southern Pacific. And uh, we obviously just acquired the, the Philippines. And so you know, they're kind of just ruling Russia out and dividing up the, the uh, you know, Western Pacific among themselves. Uh, Roosevelt actually won the Nobel Peace Prize for this. Following Roosevelt, Taft from 1908 to 1912 also encouraged an imperialist foreign policy, although more subtle in what became known as dollar diplomacy. The United States would pay off a Southern or Central American country's debts and thereby assume the role of creditor. And that, of course, allowed the opportunity to control that country's actions. Uh, if you ever owed somebody money, they're on you like white on rice. That was an, a justification for us to get involved. You owe us money. Dollar diplomacy constituted an early form of economic imperialism, uh, but that whole concept is something left for better left for another day. In any event, despite all the activity in world affairs, uh, when Wilson came into office in 1912, his focus was on domestic reform, uh, not really foreign policy. He, he wanted to continue the progressive movement, and he quickly went to work. For example, he got uh, additional antitrust laws passed, things like the Clayton Antitrust Act. Wilson worked to strengthen the government's ability to stimulate the economy. With no central bank, economic fear periodically spread, and people would rush to withdraw their money, concerned their bank would go bankrupt, or what became known as a, a bank panic. Such panics had precipitated economic downturns known as depressions. Wilson believed that a, a central bank would allow the government to pour money into the economy quickly to stop a panic, while also allowing greater ability to restrict the money supply in times of hyperinflation. The result was the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, which basically created the monetary system, the money we have today. Controlling the uh, monetary system, deciding how much money is in the economy, is the Federal Reserve Board, commonly referred to as the Fed. You can see their building in Washington here. Focusing on his domestic reforms, Wilson created a more, more regulatory agencies, for example, it was under Wilson that the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, was created. But in domestic policy, Wilson had one great, great obvious failure. He was a progressive, and as a progressive, and from the South, 
he shared many of the racist views of African Americans. So Wilson was a segregationist who brought Jim Crow laws back to Washington, D.C. But in other respects, the legislation that he and Congress got passed uh, <clears throat> was quite positive. He, uh, he, he got the Keating-Owen Act uh, passed in 1916, which prohibited child labor. He had the Adamson Act also that same year that required uh, railroad companies to give their workers an eight-hour workday. It was under Wilson that we see the first workman's compensa compensation. With the economy growing and all the cars out and about, Wilson got Congress to pass the Federal Highway Act of 1916, which sort of provided for funding and controlled a spread of a system of federal highways, uh, each numbered. He was well, Wilson was a reformer, and so he uh, he inherited the uh, the conservation and preservation ethic, and and he. Uh, united a, a number of national parks and created what became known as the National Park Service. You can see where the national parks are in this map. Wilson pushed and won uh, a, a number of reforms of the Supreme Court and uh, they were transformed American governance. For example, there was the 16th Amendment which declared that a uh, income tax was constitutional. Remember when I said the uh, problem of uh, there's no direct election of U.S. senators, state legislatures, often corrupt, would appoint them. Well, the 17th Amendment, passed during Wilson's presidency, provided for the people to elect their senators as well as congressmen. Well, of course, it was during Wilson, during the progressive uh, age, that Congress passed the 18th Amendment. And uh, that was, of course, prohibition. Here you see a newspaper article, the U.S. is voted dry. Supporters of prohibition successfully tied the movement to patriotism as World War I broke out. Well, if uh, that isn't the most, if that's a pretty infamous uh, amendment, Wilson also got the 19th Amendment passed. And uh, that, of course, was the uh, victory for all those progressive women suffragettes. It, it allowed women the right to vote. In the first national election the women uh, voted in, was in 1920. Prohibition during the Progressive Age in Wilson, of course, uh, sort of to set the stage for a lot of controversy uh, uh, throughout the 1920s, a story for another day. So Wilson, he's focused on his, his domestic policy, but uh, 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 in foreign policy, he, he was kind of an idealist. He believed a, a lower tariff, for example, would help all countries. Wilson, addressing Congress personally in 1913, you can see here, was seeking this tariff reform, and ultimately Congress passed a, a lower tariff he wanted, the Underwood-Simmons tariff, which was the first time they have less protectionist uh, tar tariffs in a, in a long time. Although Wilson hoped, uh, had hoped to focus on domestic policy, Wilson's idealism meant that when it came to world affairs, he was not an imperialist. Now, be careful. Neither, however, was Wilson an isolationist. He was willing to get U.S. involved beyond the Western Hemisphere uh, uh, as part of a, a collective action. You know, the U.S. getting involved in the world not for its own self-interest, the key to imperialism, but for the common good. As an example of such a foreign policy, you look at Wilson's relationship to Mexico. Now, Mexico at the time was undergoing a, a lot of turmoil, a lot of uh, bandits were out, and, and there was a civil war. And, and Wilson saw a, a guy named Carranza, shown here on the left, as the best for Mexico and uh, to keep order and, and save lives. You know? So he's going to send troops over the border into Mexico. And you can see the cartoon on the top right and picture of the U.S. troops in Mexico. But again, it wasn't because he was trying to conquer Mexico. It wasn't because he was trying to, uh, to, to uh, you know, con annex it or something. It, it's because he saw it as good for Mexico and the world and, and everybody. 
one of those banditos, by the way, was uh, Francisco Pancho Villa, and uh, he raided into across the American border into uh, New Mexico and Arizona. Wilson even sent troops uh, to the border with Mexico to protect American citizens, and uh, John Pershing, you can see him above, is uh, led this force, and he's going to be uh, important in, in World War I. Of course, by 1915, 1916, uh, if you might be aware that the war had actually, World War I had actually broken out in, uh, in Europe. And so Wilson, as it, it, it grows, Wilson's foreign policy is going to revolve around uh, World War I in Europe and trying to keep the United States out and how we ultimately get dragged in. And that is a topic for uh, a future time and uh, an another video. In any event, this concludes the first introductory video, sort of giving you the context of uh, all the World War I era age.